because their observations depend on monetary systems in Europe and, uh, and North America, as you can see. So these are um, developed country, well-funded monitoring systems. But if you put these, two to these things together, there is a global picture. Next slide. <clears throat> now let me talk briefly about future climate change that the other 18 of our 20 chapters were working on. Next, please. Firstly, we concluded that when we put all our impacts together, we can now begin to pin build a picture more systematically of what sort of impacts would occur for what amounts of warming. Now, here's a detailed table coming up, which we took a, a day and a half to get agreement on. But what it shows is that, <coughs> can I walk over here and you can still hear me or not? Yeah? Yeah. Yes, right. So as you go from <coughs> north <laughs> As you go from 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 degrees above present, this is a global temperature. For the fields that we've been looking at, water, ecosystems, food, coasts, you can see the sort of impacts, thank you Osvaldo, that are coming through. The gobbledygook on the right is all, is all the sources, don't worry about. So for water, increased water availability in the moist tropics, but in the low latitudes, can you read that writing or is it really too detailed? Thank you. Let me read out some of the things here. Increased water availability in the moist tropics and high latitudes where it's already moist. We don't want more of it. And unfortunately, decreasing water availability in the second line and drought in the semi-arid low line latitudes. It's exactly what we don't want. It makes, makes the world much less even, more inequitable. Ecosystems, up to 30% of species facing extinction with 2 to 3 degrees of warming. Corals, we know they're being bleached now. Widespread coral mortality by about 3 degrees. Can you, by the way, see those numbers? 3 degrees, and can you read coral mortality where I'm pointing? Just have to nod. Okay. <clears throat> Food supply. <clears throat> we know, we knew, but now we know much more how cereal productivity in low latitudes will tend to decrease, even with a small amount of warming. Starting at one degree, you see there's a tendency for a decrease already. Yeah, right. And for high latitudes, the problem areas in terms of emitters, yields likely to increase, because a little bit of warmth doesn't do them any harm, but there is some point somewhere up here that Easterling and his colleagues, Ar Argravalo, in this room, have found this turns down. There's a key point. Globally, we lost the line because our confidence level was too low. You put these two together, and somewhere around about here, one or two degrees, you get a global downturn in productivity from climate change. That's a sort of important point of inflection, I guess, that uh, authors would call it in science terms. That's the sort of stuff we've started to put together. Now, why is that important? <clears throat> because firstly, it shows as climate change ramps up, impacts will increase. But put it the other way around, and for the first time we can say, if you draw down climate change this way, 5, 4, 3, look at the impacts you avoid. 30% of global wetlands lost the downturn of global productivity, significant extinctions around, around the globe. It's sort of an instrument for the policymaker, a little sort of database. It's only a start, and there aren't many impacts there, but that's the sort of information base that we're working on. Next slide. Here are our conclusions about the most vulnerable ecosystem, briefly, headlines. Coral reefs, sea ice regions, those ecosystems that are in, at the margins, cold tundra and boreal forests, mountain at the high end, and Mediterranean regions, those that are, that, you know, the, these ecosystems or communities, and Fishling and Midgley, they're in this room probably as well, have done an incredible job making some up-to-date statements about these things. So that's marginal ecosystems. Secondly, low-lying coasts, again, places at the margin water resources in the middle latitudes because of that previous line, decreases in water resources in dry areas, low latitude agriculture because any amount of warming is going to decrease yields there. That's exactly what we don't want, isn't it? 
We've got 500 million hungry people in the world today, according to the FAO. Those numbers are likely to increase as a result of climate change. And particularly, another vulnerability is human health in those areas where adaptive capacity is low, where there's malnutrition, poorly uh, developed health, public health systems. And the next, corals are one of the issues, particularly affected by ocean temperature. But here's another new point not reported yet in the IPCC and not yet widely reported in science. We've now begun to realize that increasing levels of CO2 in the atmosphere are absorbed into oceans, carbonic is it, or carbolic acid, acid, one of those two, making for ocean acidification, not the sort of thing that corals want, any shell forming organism. So an additional impact now just beginning to be reported in the science literature are impacts on shell form ecosystems, mollusks and so on in oceans. And next, here is the sort of impacts mapped which we've done and uh, Kunzevich and Mata who are in this room uh, from Poland and Venezuela have been working on this identifying not only the sorts of precipitation patterns, this is a distribution of runoff, in other words the water that results first from precipitation, which isn't evaporated, the combination of the two. And have been plotting some of the um, sticking points, if you like, flooding, thinning of the freshwater lens in some islands, increase in pathogen load in polluted and heavy laden precip precipitation and so on. Let me briefly mention the regions most affected. There's often difficulty at UN levels in picking out particular regions. We weren't able to list them like this, but I'm listing them for you. These are the things, the places we think are the tipping points regionally. The Arctic because of high amounts of warming. Sub-Saharan Africa because of drying. Small islands because of their inherent sensitivity, lack of infrastructure, they're on their own. And Asian megadeltas, low-lying, in the path of, in, of typhoons and increased frequency of those and milli, well, billions of people, billions of people. And next, <clears throat> thermohaline circulation. The three authors in this room, I see Steve Schneider here, I'm sure would be interested to answer questions for you. <clears throat> there has been a lot of shut, talk about shutdown of the North Atlantic thermohaline circulation. Their conclusion is that, firstly, this is very unlikely. And even if it did, temperatures would probably continue to increase in Europe and North America because of the warming influence. So the shock horror stories you hear about Europe may freeze and the next ice age, <clears throat> this group and others in working group one have in a sense proved to be in very low probability. In the longer term, the issue may be different. And there may be important changes from that, effects of that in terms of marine ecosystems and fisheries and ocean CO2 uptake. And I think we're near the end now. Next slide, just click it on. <clears throat> and then there's the issue of extreme weather events. We've often talked about sort of incremental climate change. Now we've got some more information of how weather events may change, floods, droughts, the number of warm nights, the number of heat waves from working at one, and are translating that into effects of of, uh, on impacts. For example, the number of people that are put at risk every year by increased heat waves. People living in you know, corrugated iron roofs in summers where uh, days are above 40 degree centigrade is not much fun if you've got no access to cool places. And people die from heat stroke who perhaps didn't die before WHO is beginning to show. Now this is not a result of anything like those conditions, corrugated iron roofs or, or people without the support. But you're well aware of this sort of event, which was extremely unlikely, one in three to four hundred years, never occurred on the, um, on the precipitation record or the, the thermometer record of those numbers of deaths in Paris in summer 2003, between a half and two thirds of which the the estimation is was due to climate change and the rest variability peaked on top of that. Next slide. To all this, we've had a set of authors working on adaptation and their conclusion is that for all the talk about mitigation, and there's a lot of talk in the framework convention, 
it's adaptation that is going to be necessary in the near term. Why? We've got the tools ready.